Hello everyone and thank you very much to, for coming uh, to what is our third public exhibition for Wayside Urban Village. Today we're focusing on highways and transport. Uh, my name is Joseph Bow. you can see my image just there, I work for Curtin & Co. The reason why we're not using webcams this evening is because we want to maximise the amount of space that's available so that you can see as much of the presentation as possible. I appreciate that this presentation this evening might be new um, to what you're used to. Normally we do face-to-face -face, uh, public exhibitions. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes to explain exactly how this all works. The first thing to say is obviously, as I said, we want to maximise the amount of space available to you. So if you can go into full screen mode by clicking the full screen icon at the bottom of the screen. So if you could do that now. Step two is that we want you to ask as many questions as you like throughout the session. You can do that by clicking on the question icon and then as, it, as, you, as you can see there it uh, creates a pop-up and you can put your questions in. Those questions will be collated and we will respond to them over the next few days. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that more than 100 questions have been asked from the public so far about these proposals uh, and we're committed to getting back to you as soon as possible. So please ask as many questions as you like this evening. And the third and final thing is to say that we also are trying to be as accessible as possible. Appreciate that some of you might not be able to attend the whole presentation today, which is why we've um, put, uploaded a copy of both the banners as well as the electronic copy of the invitation that went to community groups and councillors to advertise this exhibition. I should say as well that this uh, session will be recorded so we will be uploading a recording of the exhibition onto the project website tomorrow morning, in addition to the banners that are on display this evening and a host of other material. So without further ado, I'd love to hand over to Lee Edwards to talk a bit more about why we're here this evening. So over to you, Lee. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, good evening and welcome to the third public exhibition for the Wayside Urban Village. Uh, as many of you uh, know and remember, the Wayside Urban Village started its life some 15 or so years ago as the Slyfield Area Regeneration Project. The project is to deliver circa 1,500 homes with a minimum of 40% of these being affordable homes. It will also deliver commercial and employment space along with a neighbourhood centre and associated infrastructure improvements. The key outcomes for this project were firmed up in the Guildford Borough Council local plan as adopted in May of 2019. For your information, we will be holding a fourth exhibition on Monday the 3rd of August next week that will concentrate on climate change and sustainability. All of these exhibitions are available to, to view as uh, Joseph mentioned on the project website, details of which we will be giving you later. Back to this evening's presentation. This presentation will focus on highways and transport. Uh, this will give you information on studies and surveys that have been carried out and details of how the results from these have helped to inform the design and provide solutions for sustainable travel whilst helping to mitigate the impact of an increased population on the infrastructure network. We will not be dealing with the construction traffic impacts this evening as this will form part of a more detailed construction management plan later in the year uh, which will come out in further consultation. I will now introduce you to the project team, a few of whom we have on the call this evening. Firstly we have Gleeds who are the project coordinators, we have Savills acting as our planning consultants, ACOM are advising on all of the associated infrastructure with the development. JTP are the architects and master planners uh, showing their vision for the design. Montague Evans are providing all of the property consultancy. Curtin & Co, as Joseph alluded to, are a community engagement company. Bradley Murphy Design are a landscape architect. Mark Eadie's associates, as you'll hear from this evening, are our transport planners and infrastructure engineers. And Stantec are supporting the environmental impact assessment as submitted to Guildford Borough Council only a month or so ago. 
So without further ado, I'll now introduce Sarah from uh, Savills as our planning consultant. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Lee. Uh, so good evening. I'm Sarah Buden. I'm from Savills, as Lee said, appointed as planning consultant to the project. So I'm going to briefly run through the planning steps needed to enable the development um, to come forward at Wayside. So in terms of context, um, as Lee said, a considerable amount of work has, has happened behind the scenes uh, to start to take forward the various parts of the Wayside project. Um, with regard to the existing uses, um, as shown on the diagram here, uh, new locations have been found for the existing sewage treatment works, which is currently located on on the southern part of the site um, and will, will be relocated to the area shown in blue here. Um, the lines in the green area uh, indicate associated infrastructure works with this. The Waste Recycling Centre, currently located on the eastern end of Moorfield Road, uh, will be relocated to the area shown in red on this diagram. And new locations have also been found for the allotments and for the council depot uh, currently on site. Uh, the replacement allotments already have planning permission for their move and Thames Water and Surrey County Council will submit planning applications for the new sewage treatment works and new waste recycling centre respectively. By moving these uses from their existing locations this leaves the rest of the site available as shown in green to deliver what is set out in the local plan policy. So moving on to the planning on a large strategic site such as this, it's probably easiest to simplify the planning process into three key stages. So stage one is the creation of the planning policy framework. So in this case, the allocation of the site in the local plan, as, as Lee indicated, and also the strategic development sites supplementary planning document. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, stage two is the preparation and submission of an outline planning application for the whole site. And stage three is the preparation and submission of detailed or what we call reserved matters planning applications for smaller parts of the site. For stage one, which is the creation of the planning policy framework, this has been effectively been completed after the adoption of the Guildford Borough Local Plan in April 2019. The local plan sets out the scale and location for all types of development looking ahead to 2034. In the local plan, Guildford Borough Council considered the basic land use principle of a mixed residential led development in this location as acceptable. Indicative capacity studies determined that the site could accommodate approximately 1,500 homes based on site area, access, proximity to services, um, with 1,000 homes to be delivered for the end of the plan period, which is in 2034. The adopted policy, which is numbered A24, also states that the site must provide six gypsy and traveller pitches. 6,500 square metres of employment space, community facilities and at the northern section of Guildford's sustainable movement corridor. Policy A24 effectively provides the Wayside project team with a starting point and base requirements from which to move forward with the project. The planning policy team at Guildford Borough Council have also prepared a supplementary planning document as I said earlier, for all of the strategic sites in Guildford. And this document contains a series of design principles and objectives for the sites to follow. This SPD was very recently adopted by the Council, in fact, last week, and the Wayside team will continue to use this framework to inform the emerging proposals. For stage two, which is the preparation of an outline planning application, this is where we are now. And it's about moving on a step further and taking the policy content and starting to see how it can be delivered across the site. So the outline application process for Wayside will consider what are the key constraints on site, where might certain parts of the development go, how will people get into the site both on foot and by car and public transport, which is the main subject of tonight's uh, webinar. The aim is to set a series of what we call parameters, for example, the location of the main access route through the site, the approximate positions of any local centre, employment uses and community facilities. Um, maximum building heights, etc. The idea is to also uh, approve a design code to ensure the quality of housing and building design remains high and consistent across the whole site, as this is likely to be delivered across a 10 to 15 year period. And I will come, I will sort of talk about this in a bit more detail shortly. The housing number of approximately 1,500 will also be looked at in more detail in terms of housing mix. So what will the makeup be in terms of unit sizes? So how many one or two bed properties might there be on site? 
The Wayside development will also provide a minimum of 40% affordable housing and also use the latest data from Guildford to help inform the housing mix. The aim to, to ensure that the site provides the size and types of homes that Guildford needs. However, we are also conscious that this site will be delivered over a 10 to 15 year period, as I just said. So it will be neat, the design code will, will need to be flexible to ensure that any changes in demand and trend can be accommodated and the site is not fixed into providing units that the housing market doesn't actually need. And then finally, stage three. So this is the reserve masses applications, which are likely to follow on from late 2021 onwards. These will take smaller areas of the site and provide finer detail on housing design, height, position, um, number of parking spaces, etc., for that defined area. But the reserve matters applications must be in accordance with what is approved as part of the outline, the parameters, as I mentioned earlier. So on to time scales, which is the next slide. So a project of this scale and importance will take a number of years to complete. And as I've said, it is anticipated that the Wayside Urban Village project will be delivered over the next 10 to 15 years in a number of phases. So the following flow chart sets out the key stages with the submission of the outline application. So that's currently anticipated to be submitted by the end of this current year with a determination in early next year. In the summer of next year, I see the relocation of the allotments and then following on from that, the delivery of new housing um, at the former allotment site will take place in 2022-2023. This will then be followed by the re relocation of the Guildford sewage treatment works and then the relocation of the uh, depot and the sludge leggings. This will enable the delivery of, of new housing at the former depot site and the delivery of housing at the former sludge leggings, followed then by new housing at the treatment works. So effectively, the sequence of the phases will ensure that the relocation of key uses in infrastructure is aligned with the delivery of the new development on site. So that's the planning context. And now I'll hand over to Andreas, who will take you through the key highways and transport as aspects of the scheme as tonight's main topic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. And uh, good evening to all of you. Um, I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about myself and my team. We are uh, an independent engineering and transport planning consultancy of about 25 people. And we advise many different private sector clients, such as developers, hospitals, universities, and a lot of uh, local authorities. Our role on this project is uh, twofold. One, using industry industry standard um, and acceptable techniques to determine in an independent way the likely traffic effects of the proposals and two to find ways to contain and reduce th these effects in order to make them as acceptable as possible so that's our role it's an independent role now the team that is working on this project you can see at the bottom of this slide, and is in addition to myself, Matthew Hunter, a principal transport planner, Panos Flores, a senior engineer, and uh, Mariam Shakiba, a consultant. Next. Our work as uh, traffic engineers cannot be done in a vacuum. We have to liaise with many different stakeholders in order to agree on different parameters before the traffic analysis can even begin. So some key stakeholders are shown on this slide and include different offices at uh, Surrey County Council, who are the Highway Authority, offices at Guildford Borough Council, as well as Highways England, plus other parties, such as the local bus operator, and of course yourselves, the public. Before going on, please allow me to explain a few technical terms shown on this side, slide. The first one is that strange word called TRIX. Uh, this is a national database that everybody in the industry uses. 
It contains hundreds of traffic surveys from around the country about residential developments, about retail, employment, leisure, all the different land uses you can imagine. Whichever data you require, any traffic consultant can then go on that database and select appropriate examples to use in order to determine um, the likely traffic generation from a particular proposal. So, for our case, we would not use examples from Scotland, for example. We will take sites from the southeast of the country and make sure that they are relevant and appropriate to what uh, we are proposing. Uh, the other word you will see there is census data. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. We have used census data information to to tell us about how people travel and to give us information about car ownership statistics, which again we use in the analysis. Then uh, the slide makes reference to a number of different traffic modeling software with some um, funny names such as Arcadi, Picadi, Linseek and Vizim. And this software enables us to test the capacity of different junctions, whether these are roundabouts, traffic lights, or simple T-junctions. Next. So there is no doubt that a proposal for 1,500 homes plus other ancillary development will give rise to new traffic. Nobody can deny that. The first thing that you should therefore seek to do is to try and make the development as sustainable as possible. Why do we need to do that? Because one, a more sustainable development will reduce traffic. Two, because it is government policy. And in any case, three, a sustainable development creates a healthier place and therefore healthier and happier people. The question is, how do we achieve a sustainable development? We do so in two different ways. One, by building what we call a mixed use development. This means that we do not want this development to be just another housing estate. We want it to have houses, of course, but it will also have employment areas, a square with cafes and other shops, and lots of different green areas. This will result in what we call internalization of trips, i.e. not every resident will need to get in their car to go elsewhere for work or to shop or to uh, carry out any leisure activity. They will be able to do so on site. Therefore, as a result, there will be less traffic. And two, we will introduce several measures to encourage people to move about in anything other than a car. How will we achieve this? I will give you details later on, but the intention is that we will build better cycle facilities, better green ways, and these are the green fingers you can see on this slide, and better buses. Again, the effect of all this will be a little less traffic. I'm not pretending that this will eliminate the traffic. We cannot carry out a revolution just on our own, but we will definitely be reducing the traffic numbers whilst at the same time helping to change the mindset and people's dependence on the car. Next. So we go on to ask how we will support sustainable travel. Next. The application for this development will be accompanied by a separate report known as the travel plan. And this will list many different ideas with the aim of reducing as far as possible car travel. Significantly, existing residents will also be able to take advantage of these measures, which will include by way of an example, a cycle center on site offering several free benefits, including the possibility of a cycle dog, i.e. someone who will repair people's bicycles at a discounted rate, or 
a car club which will initially offer discounted use. Um, we will also have free bus tokens to all new residents to encourage as many of them as possible to use the buses. We will have a car sharing database, which will of course be voluntary as well as confidential. This will enable people to liaise with each other. Are you going into the town center, etc., and therefore uh, enable them to share a car? And finally, we will introduce electric vehicle charging points to help the governments push towards uh, away from fossil fuels. We'd like to hear your views about these initiatives. Will they be of interest to you? Suffice to say that it has been found that the good travel plan report can reduce traffic by around 10 to 15 percent. So this can be a very significant package of measures. Next. In addition to the separate travel plan report, we will endeavor to improve buses, walking and cycling. Taking buses first. A lot of people are skeptical about buses. They do not believe that, that, that buses can serve any meaningful purpose. And yet, look at this quote here. A developed country is not a place where the poor have cars, it's where the rich use public transport. So, if there is a high enough frequency and good facilities, then a sizable proportion of the population will use them. It's very difficult at the moment because of COVID to have any meaningful discussions with bus operators about a new service but we expect that there will be a, requir a requirement in the Section 106 agreement for this development to provide and fund a high frequency bus service, which will benefit new as well as existing residents. There is also a lot of skepticism about cycling, and yet the tide is turning. See what the Secretary of State for Transport said in May of this year walking and cycling will become the norm for urban travel with cars pushed to the periphery. This will be embedded, this will soon be embedded in government policy as the government has just published its decarbonization transport agenda, which is currently out for consultation. Next. This next slide shows all the different excuses that people use to avoid cycling. Yet, the government is proposing, is promoting cycling in order to reduce traffic, but also to improve the nation's health. Only today, we have had the announcement for a new government strategy against obesity. The conclusion is that good facilities with good facilities, more and more people will be encouraged to cycle, as we have seen in places such as Freiburg in Germany, Copenhagen in Denmark, and Cambridge, three towns where 30% of all trips are by bicycle. Compare that to Guildford, where the percentage is a mere 3%. This means that there is a lot of potential for improvement in the town. And the, the example is led by other cities in the UK. For example, Nottingham has seen a 28% uplift in cycling, whereas Leicester has seen a 16% increase in walking and a 43% increase in cycling. Next. So, encouraged by these results in other places, we are proposing a sustainable corridor through the middle of the development, which will contain a segregated cycleway as shown on this sketch. We are also exploring new cycle facilities from the site down to the junction with the A25. Subject to discussions with the National Trust, we are also exploring improvements along the towpath. Next. I now come to the access points that are being proposed for the site. As you know, we have the river running all the way to the site. Going north, the so-called Clay Lane link, 
does not make sense as the vast majority of trips want to go south. We therefore need to go west to walking road in order to access the site. We know that something like this would place pressure on the existing roads, and we have therefore tried to dilute this pressure by distributing all the traffic on four different uh, routes. Number one, the bus depot road, we at the bottom of the site, which will be for buses, cyclists, and pedestrians, because as I said before, we want to encourage sustainable travel. Numbers two and three at Belfields Road and Woodlands Road, respectively, will be for residential traffic. And number four, via Moorefield Road, will be to the new employment area that is part of the proposals at the top end of the site. Next. I, I am now going to explain to you how we have assessed the impact of all the development traffic on the surrounding highway net network. Next. First, we consulted the TRIX database that I had mentioned before. That's the top uh, square box uh, on this slide to see how much traffic the proposals are likely to generate. This gave us what traffic engineers refer to as trip rate per house. As you can imagine, not every house generates the same amount of traffic. For example, a four bedroom house in the countryside will give rise to more cars than a one bed flood in a town. In our case, it's worth remembering that more than 70% of the units will be flats. These will vary from one bed, two bed, three bed, etc. We also have, as Lee said earlier, 40% affordable homes. These are for nurses, policemen, etc., which again tend to generate less traffic. So all of these gave us the correct trip rates for all the different types of houses planned for the site. These rates vary from 0.2 to 0.5 trips per house in each peak hour. Please note that all the analysis is done for the morning peak hour, that's between 8 and 9 a.m., and the evening peak hour between 5 and 6 p.m., because these are the two worst times for traffic. We then, having established the, the peak hour traffic flows, we then have to say to ourselves, where is all this traffic going to go to? I.e., how do we distribute this traffic onto the different roads? To do this, we used census data from this ward, which shows where people go for work. And we ended up with roughly two thirds of the traffic heading south towards Guildford, and one third going north. The next stage in the analysis is when we have to say to ourselves, over and above our own traffic, will there be any more traffic on the roads? The answer is of course, yes, because there are other things happening in and around Guildford. So we agreed with Surrey County Council that we will take the year 2033 as the design year for the new development. This is the bottom box on this slide, by the way, dealing about the background traffic growth. So the year 2033 is the design year for assessing the traffic impact of the proposals. This means that all the houses should have been built by then. And using a growth factor from the county strategic model, we growed all of the traffic that's currently on the roads to that design year. So we increase the existing traffic on the roads by a certain factor that we have agreed um, with the county based on the strategic county model. We then added all the traffic from our own site. And this gave us what we call the design year flows. These are the traffic numbers that we have put into the different traffic models. That's the oval shape uh, on the right in, in my slide. 
and we are currently trying to assess the impact of this traffic on the different junctions in the area. Next. This next slide shows the numbers that we have calculated using the above methodology. These are not the final, final figures, but they are close. So, roughly speaking, there will be about 300 extra vehicles on Belfields Road during the morning peak hour, about 100 extra vehicles on Woodlands Road, 15 to 20 extra vehicles on Old Farm Road, and something like 60 to 70 vehicles on Moorfield Road. These numbers may surprise you, but I assure you that they are based on the correct methodology that I had outlined above. I should also say that these will be the numbers once the whole development is built, i.e. sometime around 2033. During the intervening years, the numbers will be less, and in fact, probably minimal for the first um, four to five years, because it will take that long for planning to go through, planning conditions to be discharged, the site to be cleared before they start building some of the houses. I will now go on to explain these figures a bit more. Next. To start with, please remember that not every house has a car. In fact, 21% of all households in the local ward do not own a car. Secondly, on any given day, a proportion of people will not travel to work because either they are off sick or because they work flexi time. Thirdly, more and more people work from home. And finally, as you can see from this graph, about only about 11 to 12 percent of all daily traffic movements take place in the peak hours of 8 to 9 in the morning or 5 to 6 in the evening. So um, most people say that 1,500 uh, houses will give rise to 2,000 or 3,000 car trips in the peak hours. That's not true. And this next graph confirms what I've just said. Next. This graph shows several transport trends that influence the traffic figures that go in the analysis. You will see that over the last 10 years, the population, that's the brown line, has been increasing. And yet, the number of trips, that's the green and blue lines, have been decreasing. This is because we tend to use our car less and less for different reasons. For example, the young cannot afford a car so that in 1983, there were 46% of 17 year olds. The slide says 16, it should be, it's a mistake, it should be 17. 17 year olds who had a driving license Whereas in 2017, this number dropped to just 26%. In fact, studies have found that on any given day, 30% of cars will just sit on their driveway. They will not move at all during the entire day. This is why it's a, it's a misunderstanding and a fallacy to say, oh, there's gonna be 3000 cars on the roads, there won't be. There will be far, far less. And uh, the numbers I've shown earlier are the more realistic numbers you should expect. Next. Having established all the different traffic numbers and having growth, growth the numbers to the design year of 2033, we now move on to the testing of the different junctions. I have to say that every step of the way, every calculation, every number will be checked and scrutinized by Surrey County Council as the highway authority. So we've got the numbers for the design year. 
we now have to put these numbers into our different traffic models and see how each junction will cope with the extra traffic. You will see from this slide that we will be testing about 10 different junctions on the walking road. This is what we have already agreed with the Surrey County Council. They would like us to test the effect of the proposals on the whole uh, corridor. We have only just started this process, but the idea of the exercise is as follows. We test the capacity of each junction on the traffic model. The model will show us if there will be a problem. For example, is there a long queue? We then try different things to see if we can resolve the problem. We may widen a lane or we may add a new lane if there is space. We may change the phasing of the traffic lights. Sometimes we can change a roundabout into traffic lights and vice versa. Depending on circumstances, one may work better than the other. And that's how we go along looking at each junction and trying to identify solutions where that is necessary. Next. This next slide shows the junction of Moorfield Road, which we have already started to investigate on the model. You will not be surprised to hear that we found that this junction will experience difficulties. We therefore propose to do the following. Widen the two northbound lanes from, they are currently two meters wide, we're going to make each lane three meters wide. That's, that, that's it. Then we propose to widen the exit from the industrial estate itself and at the same time provide a southbound exit that takes you down into Guildford. And finally, we're going to add about 55 meters of extra length for traffic coming into the junction from the north. We believe that these works will not only neutralize the impact of the development's traffic, this is what we call in engineering terms the nil detriment case, but it will actually improve it from what we have at present. We are currently in the process of looking at all the other junctions and where necessary, we will be identifying similar improvements. It is also important before moving on to remember that the whole of this corridor has been designated by, by the council as a sustainable movement corridor, which means that in addition to traffic capacity improvements, we need to make provision for cycle and bus priority measures. This we will be doing in the subsequent um, analysis. Next. I now come to the more local roads of Slyfield Green, shown at the top left-hand corner, um, Woodlands Road, bottom left, and Belfields Road on the right. It is undeniable that in future, these roads will carry more traffic, as I have already shown in the previous slides, coming from the new development. Probably not for another three to four years, Remember the timescales that my colleague Sarah Buden has already mentioned at the beginning. And it will be about 10 years after that when the, all the houses will have been built. In any case, at that point, these roads will carry additional traffic. And I had shown the extra traffic on these roads on a previous slide. I should say that very little traffic, about 15 to 20 cars in the peak hour is expected to use Old Farm Road, and this has therefore not been analyzed any further. Of course, we all recognize that the increased traffic will affect these roads, but in terms of absolute numbers, I should say that the levels of, of traffic will be acceptable. Just by way of illustration, Department of Transport documents show that a 6.1 meter carriageway can carry in excess of 1,200 vehicles in the peak hour. A 5.5 meter carriageway 
can carry about 1,100 vehicles and so on. None of the existing residential roads around the site will carry anywhere near this number of vehicles, probably half. Having said that, we recognize and I accept that this will constitute a, a change on these roads and we are therefore looking at ways of minimizing this impact. We are, we are proposing to do this in three different ways. One, create new parking spaces where possible so that we can accommodate more of the existing car parking off the carriageway of each road. Two, build parking laybys or just small incursions into the verge so that cars can park along the road, but all the time maintaining a 4.8 meter carriageway for cars still able to pass. And three, introduce the trees and other greenery wherever possible, so that the four fingers of greenways that will be created on site can continue to a certain extent onto the existing roads. I should emphasize that what you see on these plans are just conceptual proposals at this stage. We propose to take local residents through more detail at the exhibition on Thursday. And once we've had your comments, we can start developing these proposals in greater detail. We want to do so with you contributing your thoughts during the evolution and design of anything that might change on your roads. Next. This brings me nearly to the end of my presentation. Before concluding, I wanted to remind all of you that these proposals are the Council's way of delivering more houses which are badly needed in the borough. We should remember that this is a good location for that to happen because one, it is brownfield land and the Council will therefore avoid building on the green belt. Two, the location is reasonably close to the town so that other modes of transport such as walking, cycling and public transport can be encouraged. Any car journeys will also be shorter and therefore resulting in less mileage, which will help the Council meet its obligations under the carbon agenda. And three, and significantly, it will remove a un rather unwelcome neighbour, the sewage works, and replace them with direct access to the river for the whole community. In conclusion, there will inevitably be more traffic, but we propose to reduce any traffic impact through a comprehensive range of effective measures, such as improvements to junctions on the A320, rationalization of parking arrangements and greening up as much as possible of the different access routes, increased walking and cycle facilities, plus more frequent bus services, and the travel plan report containing many initiatives to help new and existing residents move without the need for a car. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening, and I now hand over to Lee Edwards from Guildford Borough Council. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you all very much for your time this evening and for and thank you all very much for your support and feedback as this makes the series of exhibitions even more valuable. As mentioned earlier, there are several ways to provide us your feedback and to ask questions. These are by email, telephone, via the project website or by traditional post. The project team will be replying to all questions over the coming week and a copy of the presentation will be made available from tomorrow on the project website. Thanks, thank you once again, and I will now pass you back to Joseph. Thank you very much, Lee, uh, and I hope everyone has had the chance to ask as many questions as you like. I understand from my colleagues that we've had quite a few questions this evening, which is absolutely fantastic, and we will spend the next few days going through them and responding in as much detail as we possibly can. Um, I've said before that this is a start of what is quite an intense but meaningful process of engagement with not just local residents but also the community and councillors as well. 
We've had three sessions so far on different topics. We've also got a session next Monday focusing on climate change and sustainability, and there is still more than enough time to sign up for that particular session, and you can do so via our project website. And then what we will do is spend the majority of August compiling your feedback, collating your questions, collating your comments, and working up a draft master plan to present to the community in early September. We will do a, a further public exhibition, uh, quite a large public exhibition in early September. We will then revise the, revise the proposals further and conduct a final public exhibition in early October with a view to submitting a planning application, an outline planning application uh, before the end of the year with a reserved matters application to follow. So that's the process. Um, as I said before, if you want to download the information, um, that will be available on the project website tomorrow morning, along with a copy of the PowerPoint uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, as well as as well as a, a lot of documents in addition to that. The only other thing to ask this evening is obviously that we we do really want your feedback, and um, we've created a survey for you to fill out if you've got time this evening. Alternatively, you can fill out the feedback form that's currently available on the project website. So I'm going to end the session now, but as I do, please fill out the survey and we'd really, really like to hear from you and to hear what you have to say. So thank you very much for coming and take care. Goodbye.